Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You are watching Big Picture with me, Vishal Dahiya. Today we are going to talk about the expansionist goal of China and how we are tackling it. In fact, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh in an interview recently has clearly said that there will be no reduction in the troops on the LSE till the time there is a status quo there. He also said that if a country is expansionist and tries to occupy our land, then India has the strength capability and power to not let go of its land to anyone's hand. Also added that India will not tolerate anything that hurts its self-respect and will not compromise on its pride. So to understand the entire issue in entirety, we have a distinguished panel of guests with us today. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with Mr. Vivek Karju, former investor who is with us. We also have Dr. Shriram Cholia, foreign affairs expert, and Sudhrusi Katoch, the director of India Foundation is also joining us. Welcome, all of you gentlemen, to Rajya Sabha Television. Let me begin with you, uh, Jan Karoch, and let's uh, start by understanding the context of this entire issue as well, also taking into consideration that what the Defence Minister says uh, is something which has been the policy for quite a long time now for India, and we are treading on that particular line only. Oh, well, to, uh, put, uh, to put what the Raksha Mantri said in context, uh, let me state that China's expansionist designs have been going on for a very long time now. Uh, in fact, it started ever since the Communist Party came to power in uh, China in 1949. Now, they have set their goals very firmly on the Himalayas. Uh, they have been treading very cautiously. They have been um, biting and what we call nibbling uh, pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, actually, they have made great inroads, especially what they did in 1962 onwards where the entire Aksai chain area uh, they laid claim to and uh, physically they have, uh, they have occupied that area too. Now, uh, I think the key is to understand why are they so keen for the Himalayas. Uh -huh. Now, in the Chinese philosophy, when they're looking at Asia, they want to be the hegemon. And the only challenger is India. Now, if they can get control over the Himalayas, it really means getting control over the waters of the Himalayas. And once you control the waters being the upstream river, you exercise, uh, you can uh, literally blackmail the countries which are the, uh, uh, to which the water flows. So I think when you're looking at the strategic interests of China, if they control the Himalayas, in a sense, they control India. Now, that is why uh, right from the time when, Chao, when, Mao, when Mao made his famous statement uh, of the palm and the fingers, he called Tibet the palm and then he referred to uh, various Indian territories, uh, and uh, he also referred to Nepal uh, along with those territories and Sikkim at that point of time uh -huh. as the fingers. So he had his eyes right from then uh, on Arunachal Pradesh uh, and going right up to Jammu and Kashmir. And this has been the philosophy of China trying to get control over those regions. And once they exercise that control, if they can capture it, whichever way they do it, uh, uh, they will be the hegemons of Asia. Now, that is the larger design. Now, as far as India is concerned, I think for the first time, and I saw this very, very, very clearly from 2014 onwards, where the pushback started and the Indian government, the political establishment especially said, no, this far and no further. Uh -huh. Now, this has actually surprised China, and they got surprised in Doksham too, uh, with the Indian reaction, finally forcing them to go back. But I think they were surprised in Galwan also, uh, what, the incident which took place in Galwan. And uh, they did not expect that Indian reaction. And I think it is because there has been an Indian reaction that there has been a pushback against Chinese aggressive designs across the world, especially in the Indo-Pacific. Okay. And this I, think, this, I think, is a very important development. Okay, okay, definitely. That's, that's, that's quite a uh, you know, uh, apt summary of the context out there, as uh, General Katoch put it there. And Mr. Karcha, I'd like to bring you in here in, in two aspects. Uh, one is... Uh, uh, you know, uh, I believe all of us would agree uh, with one uh, point which General Katoch made there, saying that as far as China's expansionist policy is concerned, that is not new. And, uh, you know, it has tried to play its cards uh, at, 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 you know, uh, repeated intervals. Uh, but it has been surprised earlier in Doklam, then in Galwan, and now with the standoff uh, and India refusing to do a true production, not, uh, you know, accepting the status quo, that seemingly is also something which China was not expecting. 
So certainly, I think uh, the government's policy of uh, informing, of making it clear to China and to the world that uh, India will not accept Chinese expansionism and that it will be resolute in defending all its interests, including its territorial interests, is the right approach. But I'm not quite clear if there weren't pushbacks earlier. I think there were incidents earlier, and General Saab would recall some of these incidents. I do not have to recount them. Uh -huh. Where the then government mm -hmm. of India had also taken fairly strong positions, and some of these were resolved after quite a while. Now, uh, the fact is that we have to be clear in our mind that we will have to bring all our resources as a nation to four Chinese designs. Of course, they are aggressive. Of course, they are expansionist. And they think India to be an impediment in that uh, design of theirs. So the question is, are we going to re-examine the postulates of China policy that was, that was evolved in the late 80s during the prime ministership of uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, uh -huh. and which, and I'm sure my co-panelists will agree, was pursued by all governments, including the present government, as far as China is concerned. And that is why you had the Prime Minister go the ex Prime Minister Modi go the extra mile in trying to convey to China that it is necessary for India and China to coexist. But the Chinese have paid scant heed to these overtures that the government made, that Mr. Modi made personally to President Xi. So, when the Chinese response was, was negative, as, is quite, as has been quite clear from April this year, then the government has correctly adopted a stern position to defend its interests. And I believe that this country would like, and the government seems to be, quite clear that it is in consonance with the desire of the country that the status quo anti-positions should be restored as far as uh, the LAC is concerned. The fact is that we all seem to think we know of what constitutes status quo anti, but as of now, there has been no authoritative uh, sort of uh, pronouncement in this regard, yes, and this is my final point, mm -hmm. uh, Defence Minister mm -hmm. Raksha Mantri Rajnath Singh, in a statement, if I recollect correctly, of September 15th uh, this year, had told the Lok Sabha of what the Chinese had done. And we get a sense from that, but not a full sense of what will constitute status quo ante. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Chalia, two, uh, you know, two aspects of it I'd like to bring you in. One, as uh, Mr. Kardju is pointing out, that, you know, India has always believed in peaceful coexistence of uh, all its neighbours along with itself. But uh, given the fact that China seemingly has not responded positively to these, uh, you know, this particular policy which India follows and it tried to, you know, uh, push its own expansionist agenda, uh, the way we have reacted, the way Indian government has, has uh, you know, uh, put its uh, best foot forward here and uh, Defence Minister also making it clear in his recent interview, that is exactly uh, the, 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 the situation right now. But what from here onwards? Uh, Vishal, you know, if you take a global perspective, um, you know, there is this big US-China rivalry or new Cold War, as it's being called, it became very hot in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, despite uh, the change in administration in the US, the consensus appears that uh, uh, the US in particular, to a lesser extent, the Europeans, the West as a whole, will continue to eye China with more and more suspicion and um, uh, will look to try and put brakes mm -hmm. on China's expansionism. Um, in Asia, uh, of course, India, I, I agree with General Kadosh that India is the central obstacle for Chinese hegemony. And mm -hmm. so uh, they will be looking uh, to try and uh, wear us down at the LAC and also in the Indian Ocean region through naval expansionism and also through the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but on the other hand, the fact that there is this global divide between the West and China, 
Mm-hmm. We should be able to exploit it. I think uh, Dr. Jay Shankar uh, has been writing and talking a lot about this. Our foreign minister, that you know, um, as per the Chanakya Niti or the Real Politik, we should be uh, aware of these uh, fissures and should exploit them to our own advantage. Uh, now, whether we would like, uh, you know, a war between the U.S. and China, I mean, that's a bigger, bigger question. Great power wars can become world wars. But okay. short of that. if the us uh, containment strategy becomes stronger more robust uh, under biden administration if uh, it uh, the europeans also come on board they have now adopted a new indo pacific policy uh, these kind of things uh, we should be very keen to join hands with them and look to uh, you know raise the costs of this expansionism so the way forward okay. is i think confrontational uh, approach with china will increase we cannot uh, unfortunately um help that but um the uh, counterbalancing efforts on our part should be you know very strong and should we should not let up in fact uh, i think there's more to be done with diplomacy not only bilateral with the chinese we have been talking a lot with chinese as you know vishal so many rounds of uh, t- uh, negotiations mm-hmm. have already happened since april may and the for disengagement and de escalation all that but that's okay that's at one level but we need to show Uh, up our broader global uh, you know alliance structure or whatever we want to call it partnerships in such a way that the chinese realize that they are hacking at their own feet the chinese okay. realize that you know they should not be earning india's enmity like this because it will cost them dearly so mm-hmm. i think that message if we can get that across to the chinese through our moves both uh, through our resolute uh, defense maneuvers in the indo pacific and in the himalayas but also through our broader multilateral diplomacy okay. i think that will be and and also economic front also we are pushing back we have imposed barriers on their apps digital strikes this year the trade deficit with china has reduced it used to be 60 billion dollars until 2019 now it has come down to 40 billion dollars so uh, there have been you know various non tariff barriers that have been imposed uh, to raise the costs of this So I think uh, Narendra Modi government is on the right track. We want to deter aggression, but we also want to convey a signal that we are not interested in war. Frankly, war is bad for everybody. So I think the Chinese should realize that they have crossed a certain limit and that they need to step back now. I don't mean simply literally and figuratively the LAC limits that they have crossed, but generally in their behavior, you know. so i think we want a behavioral change in china and mm-hmm. for that to happen great powers cannot be just we cannot wish for great powers to change their behavior we have to make them we have to force them we have to coerce them to change their behavior through countervailing pressure so i think okay. that is the big forward uh, going forward vishal okay okay general katocha would you agree with that part there that you know uh, we, we we are raising the costs uh, of this confrontation for china specifically and and it's not only when we are saying that you know uh, uh, the, the the expansionist agenda of china has to be tackled and uh, has to be battled uh, it, it it does not necessarily only have to be on the lac there are several other aspects to it as well the economic aspect and then let's not forget the indo pacific theater no that is absolutely correct and uh, i have always maintained that when we are dealing with china it cannot be a military approach it has to be a whole of india approach not just a whole of government approach a whole of india approach in which every single political party must also be on board now one of the problem that we have is the political dissonance which takes place within the country and this dissonance is really exploited by china so we have whenever we have a dispute with china or some confrontation coming up we hear voices especially from the left which appear to take a stand which is favoring china now i think uh, politically i think that needs to be corrected and that can be corrected by the people of india giving a stern message to the left thus far and no further don't do it that mm-hmm. is one okay the second point is when we when we look at um, uh, the the speaker before me mentioned very clearly that we want to avoid war and that is correct india wants to avoid war and the surest way to avoid war is to ensure that should one take place we will win it now if you are prepared to fight and win i can assure you there will be no war china will never go through that path so the key really to uh, to a war avoidance strategy is to have a very very strong air defense uh, a very strong air force over the complete tibetan plateau and uh, so long as we can ensure that supremacy uh, i i'm absolutely confident that china will not venture into a conflict Mm-hmm. the third point is really economic 
Now here, I think there are certain problems because uh, we are part of certain WTO guidelines and you can only go to some extent. But here, I think this is where I talk about the whole of people approach. I think it is up to the people of India now to boycott Chinese goods. And I've been saying this for a very, very long time. If we don't buy, China cannot sell. And the individual citizen has to make up his mind. I agree there are certain products which are cheaper, but then we have to make up our mind. You know, mm -hmm. does your nation come first or does China come first? Uh, will you be, are you prepared to save that 500 or 1,000 rupees or are you prepared for China to gain supremacy? And if 1.3 bill, 1 billion Indians make up the mind, we will not buy Chinese products or at least we will make efforts to reduce them, I think that will be a forward step. Mm -hmm. Next, on the part of the government, as far as Chinese products are concerned, because it is not possible for the government to do away with them altogether, we are manufacturing a large number of goods which require their spare parts, including in the medical sector, in the pharma sector. Okay. So leaving that aside, we've got to look for alternatives and over the next five years ensure that this deficit, the trade deficit, which is as of now, uh, which has come down to 40 billion, which I think is a very good show, it comes down further to about, say, 5 to 10 billion, or perhaps we can utilize it altogether. If we follow this approach and ensure that your defense is strong, uh, I'm certain that uh, the Chinese will not be able to maneuver. My okay. last point and a very quick one. On the Indo-Pacific, I think it is time that we got the Quad operationalized. The European Union will get on board. Britain will get on board. It is going to become a very strong initiative. And I think that could be one of the, uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the points or the pressure points which we could put against China to force a change of behavior. Okay. Okay, definitely. Uh, Mr. Karju, you know, uh, if, if you look at uh, that particular aspect, uh, specifically as both, uh, you know, um, General Katoch and uh, uh, Dr. Cholia are pointing out that it's the holistic approach which is required to tackle this expansionist, uh, you know, uh, attitude or expansionist policy China has been following in all spheres, the LAC, the Indo-Pacific theater, the economic front uh, and, and the diplomatic front as well on the international stage, on the global stage. No, I entirely agree with that. That is why I had submitted in my opening remarks that we now need to rethink the basic postulates of the China policy, which was evolved 30 years ago and which has been pursued by everyone since then. Mm -hmm. I think the time has come to, to examine it fully and thereafter to evolve a national consensus. I agree with General Katoch and with, and with uh, what uh, uh, Sri Ram has, has said. Uh, that uh, as a nation, we have to decide with the government in the lead and with clarity imparted by government on the kind of policy that the government wishes to pursue and, and take the nation along with that policy. Of course, when you want to enter into such a game, then costs have to be borne mm -hmm. and the government has mm -hmm. to wear those costs uh, and the people too have to make sacrifices. Suffices. That goes okay. without saying. I, for one, All think right. that there is no alternative to such. For far too long, we have been uh, trying to project uh, that there is space for both India and China to grow. The Chinese don't wish to give you any space at all. They've made it clear through this year. And if that is so, then these, uh, these anodyne statements that were that were mouthed by our governmental leaders uh, don't make any sense anymore. Mm -hmm. So we've got mm -hmm. to look upon China as a competitor. We've got to, at the end of the day, realize that while international diplomacy has to be resorted to, and we've got to uh, develop uh, understandings with other major powers uh, who too are concerned about Chinese conduct, at the end of the day, we have to rely on ourselves. For, for my last point is, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. which only buttresses this uh, this uh, submission that I'm making, that we have to rely on ourselves because today we do not really know the approach that uh, the president-elect once uh, of America, Joe Biden, will take when he assumes office. Of course, the uh, Americans will want to circumscribe the rise of China and try to convert it in a positive direction. But President Trump had followed one method of trying to do so. And we don't know what method President Biden will follow. 
and okay. where will india's okay. place be in his scheme of things precisely so given these variables i think we've got to comprehensively decide as a nation with the government in the lead that we've got to build our strengths in every way develop political consensus and develop a national consensus to tackle this situation okay okay, uh, okay. let's have okay. kanguni okay. comments from uh, dr cholia here dr cholia uh, you know given the variables which uh, mr karju also pointed out uh, how do you see uh, the, the kind of uh, you know policy which is to be followed and by policy it does not only necessarily have to be a security policy or a diplomatic policy and and, and a holistic approach towards tackling the expansionist designs of china well vishal india is a democracy uh, our strength is in democracy we by our very existence uh, function as a counter uh, uh, wailing or a counterweight to china which is a extreme authoritarian country that's become even more dictatorial under uh, xi jinping in the last 7 years and so i think uh, it's uh, very important that we play upon this card and bring together a wider circle of friends and admirers and uh, integrate with them and uh, clearly focus on one thing because the one of the problems with the western countries the europeans and the americans is they are often distracted by russia for everything you know they have this focus on russia as a bad uh, you know apple and that they need to uh, sanction and to punish russia and what mm -hmm. that has done is given the chinese a lot of leeway and uh, you know the, the russians would do all the talking and the firing from the front and face it from the west while the chinese behind the backs carry on and become bigger and bigger and more and more unmanageable so i think our goal should be to convince a lot of partners especially in the western world but also in the developing world that you know china poses a major problem we have not been able to create a alternative to the belt and road initiative but there are smaller initiatives we are doing with japan in the form of the asia africa growth corridor the partnership for um, disaster resilient infrastructure such kind of initiatives we need to expand in a bigger way we don't have all the resources to put on the table uh, to win over the entire developing world uh, and free them from the chinese clutches but uh, together in partnership with quad allies with other members um, you know like minded countries in asean and elsewhere we can uh, you know work around uh, this chinese uh, pressure that is mounting and i think we need to uh, be very clear about our goal within the country mm -hmm. i agree with general kotoch nationalism is important nationalism those who challenge nationalism and say we should coexist with china let the chinese step back and restore the status quo ante let they uh, not violate the agreements we have had since 1993 which dr jay shankar pointed out then let them reduce the trade deficit let them support india's uh, permanent seat in the un security council then we can relax some of the nationalism right now the indian nationalism should be oriented in a direction where we should not be diverted the west is diverted by russia let us not also be overly concerned with pakistan all the pakistan poses a problem pakistan is a proxy of the chinese let us aim at where the source of the major national security challenges this country is facing let's all unify as one country and say no to chinese hegemony i think the chinese will get the message right now they are trying to divide our country they are playing uh, one against the other and mm -hmm. trying to take advantage of our open society like they have done in western countries and also with australia so i think it's this is the time for india to really put its uh, foot forward and say we will not tolerate any more of this aggression i think okay. the moment the society is strong and unified our prime minister is willing to go any length to defend this country so i think okay. this is the uh, crunch moment 2020 revealed the true face of china and we will see 2021 onwards how india the true face of india as a rising power we need to show it okay okay definitely that is uh, true there that 2020 has revealed uh, the true face of china thank you so much uh, dr cholia and mr karchu as well as general katoch for sharing your uh, important views on this very very significant aspect uh, which is dealing with china's expansionist agenda and as our panelists were pointing out a holistic approach is required here looking at all variables uh, be it uh, regional or international and national as well we'll come back again tomorrow with a different topic till then keep watching rajasthan television